Welcome, every, welcome everyone to Community of Grace on this beautiful Mother's Day Sunday. Louder? <laughs> they need your voice. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Community of Grace on this beautiful Mother's Day Sunday. If you'll all rise, uh, stand if you're able, and join us in our gathering song, Lord Prepare Me. really necessarily want to hear me today. The old adage in preaching is no one ever leaves here remembering my words. You leave here humming the tune from the song that Tom's going to play, and that's what we get to do at the end. Um, but I've been on video the last couple of weeks, so I'm back and might as well hear my voice a little bit. Yeah, feel great. So um, my friends in the world, the people in my life who don't do my job, when they uh, look at my job and what I do, they, they don't get faith. They don't understand what church is. And I'll bet you have friends like that. I'll bet you have friends who have no idea what this is. And Christianity in the public eye is so often so embarrassing that it makes sense to me why reasonable people would kind of think what we do is weird uh, because a lot of us are kind of weird. I mean, not me. You, 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 a lot of you are kind of weird at religion. Um, some Christians believe that a fish swallowed a person and, and the guy lived in there for like three days. That's weird. Some people think that a soul, whatever that is, somehow lives forever, whatever that means. I mean, that's, that's pretty bizarre. Who, who thinks these kind of things? Some people, I, Christ, these Christians blow me away. These are the weirdest ones. Some of us believe that we should forgive our enemies, that like our lives would be better if we did that. I don't know if I can buy. This is a big, uh, that's a big thing to swallow. My friends and your friends who look at this from the outside, they think this whole thing is so bizarre. This, right now, what we're doing right now, Sunday morning, this is the best hour of the week to go have some fun. This, it's beautiful out there. What are you doing stuck in a building? We're weird. Just listening to a sanctified TED Talk, for goodness sake. Sometimes we do rituals over there with like those things where we like wash eternal sin off of a baby. What is that about? That's in this book. This book. Have you read this book? Have you ever heard? Listen to this book. It's got some weird stories. So here's the definition a friend of mine gave me years ago to try to understand what this is that we do. This is what people think about us. Christianity is the belief that a cosmic Jewish zombie who was his own father can make you live forever if you eat his flesh and accept him as your master so that he can remove an evil force from your soul that's present in all humanity because a rib woman was convinced by a talking snake to eat from a magical tree. If anyone thinks that's what we really believe, then we have a marketing problem. But anything you fill in the blank, Christianity is, then you fill in the blank, just in your heart, just like think about it. Christianity is, whatever you finish that sentence is, it's either so weak and innocuous that I can't imagine it matters, or if it's transformative and life-changing, 
it has to strike the world as weird. It has to challenge our sense of what's normal. And over these next six weeks, we're going to look at six books of the Bible that fall so clearly on that transformative and life-changing and weird. Then in July, we're going to look at a family, a really rough family, four generations of a family that will make you look at your family and think, oh, those weirdos aren't so bad. You can find them in your closet that are kind of strange. And this is going to be, they're going to have a lot of good, fun stories. And we're going to finish the summer of weird, that's what we're calling it, summer of weird, with the stories that drive you crazy, the stories that annoy you, the stories that make you think, how can I believe in God if that's what it means? And we're going to try to answer those questions. So we're going to get started today, weird books. And since none of you remember anything I'm going to say, you remember what he's going to play? Tom, let's start us out. Buenos dias, and happy Mother's Day. For this morning call to worship, please join in reading the highlighted sentences. God, our mother, we thank you for grounding your character in the tenderness, protection, and even the sorrow of a mother. On this day, we're reminded that we do not begin with ourselves. We pray for the mothers who have protected us, who are weary, who have stayed, who were absent, who are grieving, who are proud. We are made of more than just us. Please remain standing and join us in our morning song, Hear Our Praises.
you, band. This morning's scripture comes to us from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and later on from verses 9 through 20, this, the 22nd. In preparation, I invite you to open your heart and mind to receive God's message, message through a reading and praying. Let us pray. Come as us now, O Lord, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the balm of your word. Speak to us in clear tones so that we might feel our spirits leap for joy and skip with hope as your resurrection witness. Amen. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace.
And now it is time for the children's sermon. So we got a little Henry over there. We might have an Izzy back there. Boy, that is that is a Mother's Day present right there. I'll tell you what. Oh my gosh. He's so on the spot there, poor guy. Well, Sydney, is there any word that you heard Maria say like 29 times? Yes. Time. Time. You got tired of that word, didn't you? She got tired of turn, but it was t time, time, time. If I know anything about moms, <clears throat> it's that moms never have enough time. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I, I thought that might be the loudest one of the day. I'm not sure. <laughs> and that's why today can be kind of special, Henry. However you feel about your mom, however any of us feel, whether... Some people want to desperately be a mom, or whether we miss our mom, or whether we want to take a break from being a mom once in a while. Today is a chance for mom to take a break from the things that wear them out. There's a time to do everything, and that means there's a time for moms to rest. And there's a time for Henry to learn from mom, and a time to fight with her about bringing, her up, bringing him up here. There's a time to hug moms and thank them, and a time to get mad at them for making us eat vegetables. And there's a time to wonder how it is for moms. So we get to pray together. Dear God, thank you for being like a good mom with tough and tender ways of love. Amen. All right. Thank you, Henry. Now I will be reading from Ecclesiastes, book 3rd, 9 through 22nd. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all, and yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. God has put, has put a sense of eternity into the human heart. Even though people can see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So, between hard work and beauty, I concluded there's nothing better than for us to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. It is God's own gift that we should eat and drink and be merry with the fruits of our labor. And moreover, I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it, nor taken away from it. God has arranged it like this, so that we all should stand in awe. For what is happening now has been going on forever, and what will happen in the future already is written. God makes the same things happen over and over again. And I also know that anywhere under the sun, even in the halls of justice, evil is there. Even the courts of law are corrupt. So I said in my heart, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. While we're at it, I was thinking about the human condition how God proves to people that we're like animals and how we share the same fate. We both breathe, we both must die, so people have no real advantage over the animals. It's all meaningless. All go to one place. From dust they came and dust they will return. Who even knows whether the human spirit goes upward and the spirit of animals go downward to the earth? So given all that, I decided that there is nothing better, better for us people than to enjoy our work. That is our lot in life. And no one can bring us back to see what happens after we die. This is the word of God.
Okay, Maria got a pretty weird message there, and it's the maybe the weirdest book. Maybe this is the book that does not fit in the Bible the most. We'll see if you agree. Because I started to write a sermon to explain Ecclesiastes. Yeah. I, I thought about how the good news is supposed to be good news and how that it, it takes some work to get from what, what she said to what God means. So I thought I'll sketch out a path through the theological maze. You know, Ecclesiastes is written by a fourth century philosopher and a bunch of Persian cosmopolitans who believe blah, 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 blah. And you ever start a sermon and you get to about page and a half and you just, just throw it away? Frequently, okay? Okay, that happened. So maybe I was going to focus on the turn, turn, turn part, because you all know that part. It kind of makes sense, even if it doesn't make much biblical sense. But we could focus there, and gi- what we can give ourselves the grace for when we want to you know, throw stones at people or tear up things and hate people and kill people, which doesn't sound like the good things to give ourselves grace for. But you know, in reality, turn, turn, turn is kind of esoteric stuff about grasping for some stability in a world that just seems always off kilter and spinning. Maybe when the world feels like a total mess, there's nothing to hold on to. So, you know, break, build, seek, lose, war, peace, doesn't really matter. It's not exactly good news, is it? Praise Jesus. We'll never have it figured out. The best we can do is to wing it and hope for some combination of, you know, God's mercy and our luck. I mean, Kathy, when you've preached, do you ever get to the place like, this is just not joyful enough, so throw it out. Yeah, this, this happens. Okay, so third try. That's not going to preach. At least we can get to the feeling that Ecclesiastes is coming from. That seems ripe for something. Because Ecclesiastes is just worn out. He's just tired. Of everything. He's so tired of just this. His life, the world. He's worn out by trying so hard and not getting anywhere. He's worn out by, I mean, I don't know, maybe he put an offer on a house, and a second house, and a third house, and he can't even get there. And then the houses keep going up. And how's he supposed to get some stability in his life? He's worn out by, you know, dating this person, that person. That doesn't work out. He's worn out by that. He's worn out by at work. I, ever, I try to do this thing over here, but it just always falls through the crack, and someone else's incompetence messes up everything I try to do. He's worn out by everything. Religiously, the world said, if I believe, if I pray just right, if I go to church, and if I act nice, not like Mormon nice, but just nicer than my dumb brother, if I act that nice, it's supposed to work. Gold star. But I've tried. I haven't been perfect, but I've tried. God knows. Barely seems to matter. My life just keeps on going. That's where Ecclesiastes' heart is at when he picks up his pen. So we're going to go there in these shadows. We're going to go into the shadows of the Bible, this place of profane disillusionment because it's real. Is it holy? I don't know. Is it inspirational? Probably not. Is it real and relatable? I think so. So that'll preach. So the first move, this turn, turn, turn thing. You're just lost. You're just lost in the world, turning in this direction, turning in that direction. So at some point, your strategy is to just try to stop worrying about all the turning and the spinning. And I've been there. It's a good step to stop spinning when you're in some places that are too rough. You just have to let it go. But you also know that that is not a place to land. At some point, you got to pick up, keep moving, keep walking. It's a theological oasis while you figure out how to drink in a deeper hope. So the second thing Maria got to understand in the beginning of her second passage there, hard work. Does it really matter? I mean, yeah, my my work matters and, you know, your work, it it matters. It matters, especially if you do something that impacts people. You know, Patty is a teacher of the year at your school. It matters what you do. But when you look at the sum of your whole life and you're sitting there on death's door and you ask yourself, you know, what it all amounts to, do you look back and say, I wish I would have worked harder? Maybe, maybe. But most of us, when we catch the wind of life's full breeze, something else fills our lungs. Something that's not work. It's not busy. It's not stressful. That seems to matter more. Is it beauty? That's the next thing. It's not hard work. Is it beauty? You know, is the point of life some, some pursuit to live a beautiful life? The most eternal principles that lead to, you know, good meditation and, and sanctity. You know, inner peace. It's great. Sounds deep. Have you ever tried to be Zen? Have you ever tried to just be, have full inner peace? 
I tried to be nice for three days. My eyes started twitching. I just can't do it. <laughs> it's so hard. It's hard work trying to be good enough, peaceful enough, holy enough, sanctified enough. It's hard work. Even if I could manage some inner equanimity, and I can't, I don't know what that would look like on my deathbed. What would a successful life look like if I was pure enough? You know, it's either give myself to everyone and die, empty myself, or ignore everyone else and fill myself. It's, no, it's too much. I give up. I don't, I, I, Ecclesiastes says I'm not playing that game. So instead, let's eat, let's drink, and if you've got enough cash, let's be merry. See, it's not so holy, is it? It's more of a, what the heck am I supposed to do in this mess of life? But, but four, he gets, he says, it's not even just what I do. It's not even, it doesn't even really matter what I do when the world seems to just be on this clockwork and I'm just a, a, a grind and just a cog in this thing that just keeps happening. The same problem happened today that happened yesterday. It's going to happen tomorrow. Is that your life? Same argument in your marriage. Happened today, happened next week, happened next year. Same one. Same junk in history. You know, everyone who reads a history book, it happened last century, it happened again, it's going to happen again. So what's the point? Is that God's fault? Is it that people are so pathetic? Is it just our perspective that we're too negative, we don't see the actual progress hiding in there? Or is it just me, and I'm the one stuck in this loop, which God is a pretty cool trick that you've set the world up like a clock and you just throw it down the, down the way there, but I did not buy a ticket for this ride. Hallelujah. Okay, so that's all big picture. So the next thing Maria read, it's Maria's fault, she read it. So the next thing, what about here and now? That's the big picture. What about now? Because I know everywhere under this, I can't get away from it, this, this brokenness, evil, junk. My computer makes me curse more than anything in my life. Yeah, you too, you too. Traffic, like I'm just getting so tired of, of everywhere I go. I can't get anywhere. Uh, I tell myself to rest more, but do you, do you get enough sleep? No, me neither. Uh, you know, what about communication? How many of you, like everyone in your life, you're able to communicate with really well? Is there like a path for this that I just haven't learned this trick? Everywhere under the sun, even in the places. There are places in the world, maybe churches, maybe doctor's offices, Maybe the people we look up to the most. There are places where it should be honest and righteous, but everywhere there's brokenness and evil. I mean, get this. This is Ecclesiastes 2,400 years ago, and we, we, we picked this scripture like many, many weeks ago. He said, even the courts of law are corrupt. And then he says, if you see that, Boy, I wonder if this is going to get ironed out in the end. Because I know a lot of us suffer now. We get so sick of you know, traffic and, and our own stuff. But the courts of, when those courts of law are corrupt, don't you wish it, it kind of balanced sometime down the road? You know, like, like when the lying rapists have so much power over how this country understands rape, don't you wish they would get what they deserve? What about the manipulated fanatics who have no business being near anywhere of honesty or integrity? Will they reap what they sow? Or the manipulative wordsmiths bent on justifying socially acceptable evil, will they slide on unpunished or does God have a plan for them? Because when they have the power, when they have that much power, it doesn't seem to matter how much I do that's nice or right or helpful. When they have the power, it doesn't matter what any of us do because the court mongers keep landing on such brokenness and evil positions every chance they get. And why do they keep having so many chances? It doesn't matter how good we are when the worst of us get so much power. So wouldn't it just be poetic if God balanced the scales in the end? Amen? Amen. Oh, now you think it's holy. Yeah. Some of you think it's, and it, it, it's not, it's vengeful. It's understandable, but it's ugly. But that's where Ecclesiastes is at, just worn out by it all and angry. So he gets to tilting at some windmills, but hear him out. We breathe, your kitty cat breathes. We die, your puppy dog's going to die. And everything in between, hey, what's the difference? It's all just, what's the word? Meaningless. 
joy, where'd that joy, I promised joy, and I didn't, I'm not getting to joy very quick here. It's all just, the Hebrew word here is hevel, hevel, say that with me, hevel, it's a fun one. In the King James Version, some of you grew up with, it's, it's, it's uh, translated vanity, which is really cool. It, it literally, it means vapor. It's like the mist when you're out in a cold day and you breathe, that, that little air that then just disappears. It's, that's hevel. But the way they talked about it is everywhere in your life where like, you, just, you just do something and it just disappears, that's hevel. And he says, all of it, all of it, just all I do disappears. And so when you get to that place where all your breath disappears and floats to the ground, what do you do? One, give up. Two, one more day of courage. I can handle one more day. Okay, I, got, I can do that. I can wake up one more day. Three, pff, it's just all meaningless. Change, change the way you see the world. If you have not been there to a place of hevel, I don't know how to talk to you. I don't know how to connect with you. If you have not been stuck in that situation, you're too lucky for me to understand your life. Or if you have it all figured out, then we should listen to you instead of Ecclesiastes. Although I doubt you've ever had it figured out without being in Hevel, because uh, you couldn't possibly get it figured out without some struggle. But either way, if you do not relate to where Ecclesiastes is, you know, just get some church mints and zone out for a couple minutes. For the rest of us who have been on the wheel, give up. I can do one more day. It's all meaningless. Give up. I can do one more day. It's all meaningless. For us, how did you respond? How'd you keep moving? The drain was pulling you down. How'd you swim out? Some of you, I'll bet, found loving relationships. It was a friendship, dog, partner, a child, reconciling with your parents, whatever it is. That's great. If you think your relationship can save you, you are wrong. That won't last. But if a relationship helped you understand that you are lovable, that you matter... Well, that's progress. You matter in the world. That's progress. Some of you, you saw your coping mechanisms, and you decided to stop, or to try to stop, or to get it under control. And every day, if you focus on, don't do that, I promise you, eventually you will do that. But if you focus on reminding yourself that you matter, you matter enough not to do that, that's progress. You can keep on moving. Some of you found grace in spirituality. Some of you found grace in therapy. Some of you found grace, I, it's hard to say, it's so gauche to say this today, but you found grace in religion. Oh my gosh. And as powerful as it might be to think that you matter, to believe that God thinks you matter, that's power. To think that the creator of the entire universe cares about you, that'll get you off your knees. So we bring it home. The thing about people who have fought their way through a hevel mindset, however they get there, whatever progress it is, the thing about people like Ecclesiastes and a lot of us, and church, you tell me if I'm right here, I think that everyone who makes the hard-earned realization that you matter, I think 100% of the people who pick themselves up off their knees, their next move is to help someone else up off of their knees. All of us, when we get the message that we matter, you want to spread that to someone else. The victims who become survivors help other victims to survive their own stuff. And I think Ecclesiastes is inviting us in that space. And I think that is really holy. I think us working on things together is really holy. And as weird as it can sound and as stuck as we can get in this despairing loop, Ecclesiastes is an invitation for those of us who have been stuck to get unstuck together. For those of us who have felt so disconnected to find hope again. For those of us who have felt so ungrounded to remember that God's roots run deep. Amen?
So my dear friends, I want to talk to you briefly about the latest with the Presbyterian women. I hope you have heard about the PW Spring Brunch that is coming up in May 22nd. Woohoo! I need you to plan to attend and feel free to bring friends. You don't have to be Presbyterian to attend. <laughs> bring everybody. We have a great speaker who will be sharing inspiring stories of unique women in history. And we will also be collecting to donate to Catholic Community Service Share House Refugee Resettlement. So it will be tons of fun. Okay, number two. The second piece of information is about PW biggest fundraiser, fundraiser event, which is the garage sale. And it's just around the corner, and we are bringing back the famous bake sale. Woohoo! <laughs> This year, this, for this year only, um, we provided funds to 21 charities. Little PWCOG here, so you know we're pretty amazing women. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so out of those 24 charities, no, 20, 21 charities, um, I want to just share with you quickly the ones that we are sponsoring this year are the Malala Fund, the Afghanistan American Friendship Foundation, World Kitchen, UNICEF Ukraine, and others. So um, again, I know we're Wonder Women, but we need all kinds of people to help us. So please, please, please sign up at the PW table out in the lobby, which there is a lot of detailed information. So you might get overwhelmed, but you know, hang in there. So the first Sunday, don't start bringing your stuff yet. It's the first Sunday to bring your treasures is June 5th. And there are flyers and more information on the table. And I want to thank everyone to help us with this great and fun project. It's going to be singing here pretty soon, but um, if God has ever, if the roots of God have ever run deep here, or if you think that that can be something we can offer to this community, you are always invited to bring a financial offering to the basket in the back or online. Thank you to everyone who has supported us financially through your prayers, through every way that that happens. Now, before the choir offertory, just to set the scene a little more, um, you know that after Easter, Brian and Emily move back to be closer to Emily's family, and they're all settled. We've even got their address. The director will be coming out with a new one here on this week. And then we say goodbye to Carol, who got a great job. She's already started. She's having a blast full time up at the U. And now, Tom... So every, let's see, 52 weeks a year, plus every, you know, once in a while is an extra one for, for 24 years and Christmases and then there's funerals. And so, I mean, all, you do the math. There are people, there are children, some of your children, some of your children have grown up in this church thinking that God's own piano player is sitting right there. <laughs> Now, Tom announced his uh, retirement a few months ago, and y'all stood up and clapped up a storm, and he and Cheryl already have a bunch of travel plans. Philippines, is that where you're going first? Is that the, that's the first big trip somewhere over there? Are you going to Philippines? Vietnam, okay, Vietnam, okay, it's fun stuff there. Um, I hope we see them. Cam's going to be done with college soon, but this is Tom's last Sunday as our official piano player. He's going to play with the choir right now, and then we're going to do our prayers and do the rest of the service. And after we do our charge and our benediction, just sit around. We're going to do a postlude. Postlude means a song after the stuff we just finished. So do that postlude, and then we're going to go back there, and there's going to be some kind of cake back there, because that's what you do when you wish people on to the next place. You pray for them, and then you eat cake. Pray, and you eat cake. <laughs> That's biblical. We don't have that one lined up in the service yet, but eating cake when you're depressed is biblical. So we'll get to that. <laughs> Choir, come on up here.
Thank you, choir, and thank you for sending in prayers to me. Let's, <laughs> what did I say? Did I? A lot of people do. It's up there. You can always do this. Some of you do it before service. Some of you do it through the week. Always send them in. I'll try to keep them up right here. We're going to pray. Hey, God, I have to confess. Sometimes I wander in my prayers. Sometimes I get distracted and confused. But in my best moments, when your spirit runs through mine, I know that we pray because we breathe. We pray because we want to sing, because we've been loved, because we face struggle. We pray because we cannot stop longing for peace in our lives and the world. We pray because we know there is something beyond us, something stronger. Ease us from our shallowness into the deep waters of your grace. We thank you, Holy One, for this mysterious gift of life. For all the songs and silence, beauty and honesty, compassion and celebration, we give thanks. We give thanks for Elaine's grandson graduating from the U. We give thanks for the Fletch family welcoming a new niece, Isla Marie West. We give thanks for Tom's full lifetime of service to the church and being a friend to this body. O oh, loving Father, Mother, Source, abide with us through seasons of fear. May our spirits be open to your guidance. May we have patience to care for each other and the hope to keep going. Out of our weakness, we turn to your strength. Comfort those in sorrow. Fill those who are empty. Strengthen those who are on their knees. We ask for your hand, especially for Brooke and all those who are dealing with COVID. We ask your hand of comfort on Judy Sanders as tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of her loss of Ed. We ask your hand on Andy as he's lost a family member on the same day that his mother died a year ago. We ask your hand for traveling mercies for Susie's family as they go home after getting to meet baby Tegan. For Robin's parents, one who has had a fall and the other which has so much fear of that. We ask your hand on the homeless neighbors who will have some sandwiches from our volunteers who are going to make those after worship, but, but we pray that they might have even more transformation in their life, an opportunity to have stability. All this we pray together and with all creation through the words that you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And may we share the peace of Christ with all those who are watching online. Okay, we're going to do the charge first, and then remember, sit and, sit and listen, and then we're going to do the cake. So the charge, I think it's going to pop up there now. There we go. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit.